um, when the feral cat's water dish is frozen every morning, I end up with all these discs of water in my front yard and they're now frozen. So we've hit winter, it's here, we're, we're sub-zero. Christina, how is it where you are? We are heading right into um, beautiful fall weather, which means all the leaves have come, well, they're coming down, which means um, as a church administrator, one of my favorite times of year where we try and um, battle the elements into uh, getting them all into bags. So I'm Christina Rivera, and I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia. Aisha? Um, I'm Asia Hauser and I'm in Seattle and it's uh it was cold last night but cold for Seattle like I don't know Je um, Jessica would you say it was in the 40s it wasn't that cold but because you know we have pretty mild weather I don't know my son was complaining and he had a sweater on and I'm like god we've gotten so spoiled I mean I lived in North Dakota for years so, where antifreeze freezes they have to plug in their cars so I've become a little soft with weather Jessica yeah, I think it was 50 last night. I'm just going to call you out a little bit on that. It wasn't that cold, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Jessica Star Rockers, also Seattle area with Asia, um, also suffering in this bitter, bitter cold. <laughs> uh, I am on Facebook um, live. I'm taking your questions and comments, and I'll pass them on to the hosts. I'm on Twitter, um, putting out anything there with hashtag the view. And um, Michael, have we heard from you yet? You haven't. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from beautiful, sunny Peekskill, New York, where the weather is, is just fabulous. It, I could not possibly complain about this beautiful, clear blue sky fall day where the high is 50 degrees. But uh, that's just perfect for New York in the fall. So greetings from the Hudson Valley. And today we've invited special guest Allison Miller from Morristown, New Jersey, to come and share with us as we reflect on the meaning and what we can learn from the elections. We're not partisan hacks. We're not here to talk about blue waves. We're more here to talk about values and black and brown waves and queer waves and all kind of waves that we're excited about. And um, and then we specifically, Allison, I was glad you could come because anti-Semitism certainly played a role in this election and in the politics leading up to it. And you, um, I know, come from a Jewish Unitarian Universalist background. So I'm delighted you can be here sharing your perspectives and also all your work there in New Jersey, which looked like an interesting place in this election. So welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And, and New Jersey was a very um, interesting place and hopefully continues to be. The work is far from over. Um, and since we're checking in about the uh, weather, I guess I, I get the, the best weather. We're going to hit a high of 52 today, but all the leaves have already dropped pretty much. But uh, the ground is like a carpet of uh, a rainbow carpet. So that's a wonderful thing. And you may see something moving in my lap. My dog Parker is sitting here with me this morning, keeping me warm. We'll see. So here in Minnesota, we had, um, I, I was very excited by what happened here in Minnesota. We had a lot of young people, young people of color run for office and do really amazing ground campaigns to get out the vote in the Twin Cities, particularly I will lift up a woman named Angela Conley, who ran for county commissioner, which is a nonpartisan position here. She's a young black woman who's worked for the county as a civil servant for years and also received county services and really felt like somebody who actually knew what it was like to deal with the county would be really good on the county commissioner. She and a Latina woman are the first two people of color ever to be on our county commission. So Angela Conley, I think, just ran such a good talk to people, talk about real stuff, let's keep it real campaign against an older white man who's been there for, I don't know, 18 years. And I wish would have graciously said someone else's turn now, but didn't. But, um, you know, it just was really inspiring to me. And I think campaigns like that really serve to get out the vote, which as in many states, the cities carry the votes. Um, in terms of progressive values, the cities and of course the suburbs. So, and also I'm thrilled that my new representative, and this was absolutely no surprise, but Ilhan Omar is now my representative. 
she is, I just want to say, you know, she's the first Muslim woman, woman now there too, but she's also just, if you've ever watched a video of her or anything, I have never been with her that I didn't cry. She is so inspiring. She's so loving. She's also really beautiful. That never hurts. But um, she just exudes hope and vitality and commitment to really making democracy work in a way that I've just never been to a single place where she spoke that I wasn't like lifted up by her. So I'm so excited about, you know, what, what it means for her to be there. Minneapolis and this area has the largest Somali population outside of Somalia. And so for all of those kids to see it, the girls, especially to see someone who looks like them representing them in Congress. And, you know, I love, she's already doing national news and everything. And she's just, she's, She's, she's the real deal. That's what I want to say. She's not just, you know, the real deal on camera. She's the real deal all the time. So I couldn't be more thrilled. We also had a huge bout of Islamophobia aimed at Keith Ellison, who ran here um, for uh, attorney general. And um, the right wing sent in their Islamophobic people out to the country. And there, you know, as we move out of here, there's so much work to be done to try to do some education because the lies that are being spread, that the hate, just the hate mail that, that uh, Doug Wardlow was sending out, just painting Keith as, you know, this militant terrorist. Um, I feel like one of my things coming out of this election is now it's time to get to work. You know, now we have these folks elected. Now we've really got to get to work to support the values they represent. Christina, Virginia was in the news a lot too. What do you, what do you guys talk about? Um, you know, I think the, one of the things that I really saw play out was a politic of lies. Like just, you know, it is, um, a doubling down of just this um, kind of not surprising, but in some ways just shocking um, campaigns just based on complete, um, not even innuendo, but just flat out can't prove it. Can't, there's no basis behind it. And so in our governor race, um, or sorry, we're our senator race with uh, Tim Kaine. Um, we saw his opponent uh, come out with just complete uh, falsehoods. We also, um, you know, are having this really interesting, at least in the South, um, tactic of, you know, really wanting to overly identify with the community of being Southern. Um, and this, you know, person really identifying as being from the South, as being from Virginia, and actually being from Wisconsin. And, um, so that was that was really interesting to see how that it all is playing out um, in local politics. You know, I think what we saw in some of our more conservative areas. I live in, an, uh, although I serve in Charlottesville, um, I live in Augusta County, which is extraordinarily conservative. Um, we did our representative actually is retiring um, and holds some higher positions in Congress. And so it was um, no surprise that um, the Republican candidate won. Um, what was surprising is that it continues to shift. The margin in those elections um, continues to shift and be more competitive. Um, and individual cities and towns within um, our more conservative areas um, are looking at more liberal candidates, candidates that supported things like um, you know, our local high school was Robert E. Lee High School, um, and the school board recently voted to, um, to strip it of that name. They're in process right now of figuring out what the new name is going to be. Um, our city council um, uh, supported the first ever Pride Festival in our town, um, which, you know, I wouldn't have thought would have happened for another five to ten years. So, um, you know, seeing some shifts but also seeing um, a lot of backlash. Um, um, I, I'm really excited that um, in the time I've been here, I've seen our Unitarian Universalist congregations um, shift a little bit in terms of 
particularly in conservative areas where it was always like, this is a place we come to where, you know, because nobody else can know that, you know, we're liberal or we have a liberal religion to being like, no, we can actually say this and, and we can host some things, you know, having to do with policy and not necessarily with candidates, but certainly with um, moving forward more progressive policies. So that was, uh, that shift has been really great to see um, in some of our more conservative congregational areas. Aisha, how about your area? And I don't know, you might track former areas where you've lived too. Maybe you track North Dakota. <laughs> I, don't know. I actually did track North Dakota and Heidi Heitkamp lost, um, which while disappointing wasn't so surprising because they've gotten more, cons I mean, I don't know that North Dakota was ever a bastion of liberal thinking, but um, but here we flipped, uh, <clears throat> there was a Congressman Riker, he was, he's not actually, he represents a lot of people who go to our congregation because I live in Seattle, but um, he, the, oh, I, I cannot, I loathe the Seattle Times. They uh, endorsed, the editorial board endorsed the Republican, Dino Rossi, who's a bonehead. There, I said it. And uh, so Kim Schreier beat him. So that that was a flip. Um, and I, I kind of guessed she would, but um, but otherwise, a, a ballot measure to uh, for for more de-escalation training for police passed. Um, the carbon measure did not pass. So this was, I think, the second time that it was up. So um, people can. I, I'm I was surprised What's that the carbon, the carbon measure, measure. I don't actually know that to add, to add tax. So it's I believe it's modeled after what they've been doing in Canada to add. Um, a tax on uh, carbon use. So I guess on gas, I said no, but it's a tax on, I believe on gas. And so um, in order to offset, to I think invest in more greener measures and people then use less gas, I guess is the idea. And when it's been done in Canada, it, um, uh, use of uh, fossil fuels uh, was reduced. Uh, so it, but it, it's been on twice and, and it's actually a pretty controversial measure here in Washington State because there's actually a lot of people of color who don't want it to pass and, and it's more complicated I'm embarrassed to say than I even get maybe Jessica I don't know if you've heard the complexity of it but uh, there's been a few groups in Washington at least in this area in the Seattle area that um, that were actually against the ballot measure especially the first time around uh, groups of color uh, uh, community organizers of color who said this is actually a terrible in the way it is so that was a little disappointing, but um, otherwise, yeah, uh, I don't pay it. I, I was really looking at, oh, there was a gun measure that passed too, I believe, right? Je Jessica, you probably know more than I do. <laughs> no, okay. No, I mean, no, a lot of what, you know, I think is going on out here is is what you're talking about, which is this, the things that um, were down to like the nitty gritty of what is progressive, enough or not progressive enough. I mean, it's already so progressive out here that um, when things don't pass that seem like no brainers, it's kind of surprising. It's like we're, we fight amongst ourselves over things that it should be a lot, it should be a lot easier seems to me, but um, yeah. I wonder if the gas tax is because it's a regressive tax because it taxes uh, product rather than income? I, yeah, I mean, Washington State has one of the most regressive tax structures in the country. And so I absolutely think there is an element of that. Um, and I actually agree with that. Um, I actually said to my husband, I voted for everything that's raising our taxes, but really not. I mean, there wasn't an income tax measure and there really, there needs to be um, just a complete overhaul of how taxes are done in the state. And, and sadly, it's like, where's the incentive to do that? People um, who are in control, want to keep it regressive. However, that's what really needs to happen. So that's true. I think that's the, um, the, the values part of it is, does it, is this just optics to make us feel better? And is it really, I mean, that's actually, I was talking to my husband, who's a former now law enforcement officer. And he said, you know, the, the de-escalation, sure. He said, but it's more optics that I've taken these and, and you know, 50 year old white men roll their eyes. And um, he said, you need to, you know, this needs to be way, there, there's so many systemic things that need to happen. Um, I mean, I think it's better than nothing, but, and we, we can't, it's like you said, Meg, we can't stop. There's a lot of work to be done. So um, I think it's mixed. I mean, I'm more thrilled about races <laughs> in other parts of the country, frankly. Hey, congrats on 25 years of marriage. That ain't nothing. Whew, it is not. <laughs> yeah, we were, it, yeah, it's, it's, 
it's, I know it's kind of like what I said was it takes a village to raise a marriage. And one of the things that I realized my husband and I, um, have, we are so blessed with wherever we, we've lived many places in these 25 years and raised two children. Now we have two dogs and just the support of, um, of friends who just deeply love us and we love them and care about us has been really invaluable. Um, I, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine staying 25 years married without a village of, of friends and people who support both of us. So I'm super grateful. But yeah, it's quite a milestone. On Facebook about talk about collaborative leadership. <laughs> truth, true. hashtag truth, man. Marriage is a collaborative leadership operation. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Michael Tino, state of New York. You know, if you just looked at the results from, from Tuesday here in New York, uh, things were really peachy here and um, New York is doing okay. Uh, we elected a majority to our state Senate that will mean that uh, gender expression non-discrimination will finally get passed after uh, 10 or so years of being stalled in the state Senate. Um, we have a majority that support a New York State single payer health care uh, program, uh, which is more complicated than just passing a law, so it might not get passed in January, but there's a majority that supports it. Um, but I want to I want to take a step back and um, and think about the run up to this election, and maybe this is where Allison can come in because we were both in the New York City uh, media market and the the racism that that was that came out in the campaigns this year was um, was blatant and and like in your face it was like beyond like the dog whistles right dog whistles are meant that only dogs can hear them this was people whistle um this was uh it was blatant and it was ugly um the 19th congressional district here in new york which is just north of me it's most of the rest of the the hudson valley is sending antonio delgado to congress uh, a black latino democrat um which is fabulous and that campaign was harsh that campaign was ugly um and you know it was it went so far beyond the he's not one of us which is that sort of coded language um the the race in in central new jersey um between tom MacArthur and andy kim which it's i guess still competitive i'll just jump in and i'll jump in after yeah uh, i i mean just they put the ads that went on uh, on the air were just so blatantly racist, um, Islamophobic, because Andy Kim has worked with um, with Muslim people, um, and he's Asian. Um, the 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 race, the Senate race in New Jersey, uh, that Bob Menendez, who is not like my favorite person in the world, but um, just the racism against him, um, it was it was just. It was something that that I'm not used to seeing in New York, and I want to believe that it's the last gasp of, of of people who know that they're that they're they're not going to be in power anymore. And I I can't believe that, right? Like I it was just it was so ugly and it was so forceful and it was so blatant. Um, so Michael, I also saw some stuff about anti-Semitism in ads with Schumer. Um, maybe, <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't see that maybe upstate, uh, anti-Semitism doesn't fly so well in New York city and the New York city immediate suburbs, just because, uh, there are more Jewish people in the New York metropolitan area than there are in Israel. So, um, but, uh, but upstate, yeah, I'm sure that the ads were anti-Semitic. And if you tie someone to Chuck Schumer, uh, who is our senior senator and the Senate Majority Leader? Um, th that that's you know it's coded anti-Semitism for sure. It is, Allison. You know what is what? What are your reflections on the things that you've been seeing in in this area? Well, a couple of things. One thing, jumping off of what you just said, though, I think especially with anti-Semitism in politics and, and in conversations, it's very easy to fall into what are sort of tropes about Jews. And so the idea of a New York Jew who has, quote unquote, 
um, disproportionate power is a siren call less for New York City than it is a ripple for people that are going to be voting in the rest of the country um, and and potentially upstate. So I'm I'm just really mindful. One thing I'm really mindful of in this election and in the language um, leading up to it, the oppressive language, the racist language, the anti-Semitic language, the Islamophobic language, is that we really, I mean, tomorrow is the anniversary of Kristallnacht when um, 30,000 Jews were sent to concentration camps, 7,000, it was a pogrom, right? The 7,000 businesses were burned and 270 congregations were vandalized and, and burned. And I, I think what is, for a long time, I think there was sort of a taboo around um, overt anti-Semitism and um, even some of it in our area um, associated anti racism and the way things are linked, but it just felt like all bets are off now. It's we've, I don't know if it's we're far enough away from the Holocaust. We've seen a rise in our schools of, of um, you know, swastikas, of the N-word, of um, just hateful rhetoric around uh, uh, immigrants. I mean, it's, it's, it's been very, I would say it's very present. Um, and, you know, I, have a little more to say about that, but I also want to share some great news, which is that at least where I live, the New Jersey 11th, we have been, Unitarian Universalists and others have been really organizing um, for change here. And there was a group called New Jersey 11th for Change that had um, really leadership deep in, in the immigrant community um, and all, all over. And we wound up flipping a seat that was, um, happened to be Republican for over 30 years, but more, even more importantly, Rodney Freelingheisen, who held that seat, held it, we're talking about by blue waves, but he held it by not making waves. Literally 97% of Morris County, which is perhaps the most conservative county in the state of New Jersey, still wants stricter gun laws in the state and around around the country because of course people come in with they can cross borders with guns and he would not i met with him several times and he was like i will not even though my constituency is for this i will not bring it up if the other guy if enough other people bring it up then i might say that i'm supportive and so we just said no, you can't take up a seat and do nothing and, and keep the status quo. And it was a huge, re really, referendum here with Mikey Sherrill getting 56% of the vote. Um, and her opponent, just reflecting as a local person, uh, at their booths, it was amazing. He was putting out flyers. Speaking about lies, Christina, he was putting out flyers that were all about how he supported sexual assault survivors. But to a T, every one of his volunteers, one of the first um, conversations <clears throat> they would have with me um, at our table at a, a couple of fairs recently, because I had a I Believe Survivors button on, was why they don't believe survivors. So they were handing out leaflets. So this is the other piece, right? There's the people that are being overtly um, racist, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic, um, et cetera. And then there are people that are actually handing things out like I'm for a diverse America or I'm for women's rights, but then to a T everyone in that group is representing the exact opposite view. So what struck me about this election was how important research was for um, you know, citizens and, and that we as Unitarian Universalists, I think have played a really critical role in helping get uh, um, information out because we love to learn. <laughs> Um, and, and we had people defending the polls and, and getting involved. And in New Jersey 7th, that was a really critical place too. In Dover, it's a huge um, immigrant population, some of whom don't have access to cars. They were driving people to the polls. People were driving people and it absolutely turned, turned the seats. So those were um, really exciting things that I, I did see uh, happen. I think it's important to celebrate the victories. People worked really hard for the victories. And when I see people on social media who are only looking at the problems, and of course the problems are huge, but 
but so many regular people work so hard for victories. And I just want to lift up the people in Texas and Florida and Georgia who are, you know, fighting massive amounts of voter suppression and graft and corruption and still, and, and I, I just gave money to help Stacey Abrams with that. Uh, I still believe she can win. And I love that she didn't step down because she, they're just cheating and lying there. But, um, you know, for Texas to be that close, that's amazing. And, and, you know, that thing I just saw this morning about 19 black women judges elected in the Houston area. That's amazing. I mean, so I just want to lift up. I think personally, like we have to celebrate imperfect victories because they're the only kind we ever get, you know? And so I'm all for really honoring and celebrating and, and getting to work, you know, <laughs> like, and acknowledging how many miles we have to go. Uh, but I, at the same time, these amazing people step forward. Christina. I, I think that's absolutely right, Meg, because I think that, um, so in Florida, we saw, you know, it's too close to call, um, but we also saw the ballot initiative of uh, restoring voting rights for felons, which is huge. Um, and it has the huge potential to, to um, you know, as Unitarian Universalists live our liberation theology, right? Like that everybody has um, those same basic um, human, human dignity, human rights. So, you know, then, then the next part of that is, well, then how do we make sure that those folks that we have um, re-enfranchised um, you know, have housing, have all of the things that then um, make it so that they're able to vote, right? That they have all of the resources that they need in order to exercise that right. Um, well, and how, and how do we force the state of Florida to implement that amendment, right? So Florida has a long racist history of ignoring things like that, right? And so, you know, just like Brian Kemp as Secretary of State in Georgia was taking people off of the voting rolls who had every right to be on the voting rolls and they were disproportionately people of color. Um, the Secretary of State in Florida or, or whoever it is that, ha that has jurisdiction over the Board of Elections in the state of Florida has to be held to account for that change. Um, and so, and, and that's a values thing. That's not a political thing. That's a, that's a who, who should be participating in our democracy value, right? Um, but we can't just say, you know, even Florida passed that, okay, a, a million and a half people are gonna get to vote in 2020, because that's gonna be a fight to get a million and a half people to vote in 2020. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point, Michael. I, you know, I participated after the 2016 election in trying to get recounts in Michigan and Pennsylvania because there were some really suspicious numbers. And what I learned, because I don't do voter issues, my sister's obsessed with it, so I kind of joined her for a while. But what I learned is how absolutely political that is. So the, the precincts with Democrats in charge were like, sure, we'll do a, pre a recount. And the precincts with Republicans in charge were like, nope, we're not doing a recount. And what you need is really good lawyers to fight. You know, that's why I gave money for Stacey Abrams. I mean, the, these things don't just automatically happen because they're law at all. And I, I was, I, I'm constantly, my, my naivete constantly surprises me, but learning how absolutely political voting is and, and who votes and how they vote and how they don't vote. I mean, I knew that in terms of the history in the South, but it's true everywhere. It's true absolutely everywhere. And um, so that's why roles like Secretary of State are so so critically important. So I'm curious, what you know, what are people feeling like are your next steps where you are? The election's over, who won one, who, who lost, lost, like, are you changing anything that you're doing? Are you thinking of adding new things? Are you, do you feel like you're already firmly in the saddle doing, um, doing what you're gonna be doing? I, well, for me, I think I'm gonna continue. So one of the, I, I think Seattle and New Hampshire were the two places where just everyone was the most engaged and even local um, 
politics and uh, measures. So, so that's really great. And one of the things I've started to do is um, there's a community center down the street from my house and I'm on the advisory an, an advisory committee to the board and I'm, I'm bringing more workshops on um, race and racism. And we're working on kind of, because I think I, part of all things are politics, right? Or political. Um, there's a lot of ways to go about this. And one of them is to really help folks understand how we got here is what I say is like, how did the United States 2018, which may seem ridiculously obvious to some, but it really isn't to most. And, and how does this play out with what it is we're trying to do? I mean, again, the fact that the carbon tax didn't pass, well, let's look at that. that well, maybe it is because of a regressive tax structure, structure. So how do we address that? So I think having um, taking opportunities with what you can bring and know, uh, and that's what I'm doing, so. Yeah, I think that's so important because, um, you know, there, yesterday and today, I, you know, I just have to highlight that a lot of the get out and vote was in areas um, where we already have our communities of color, um, you know, highly showing up. Like we're showing up for doing that voting work. Uh, black women, black men, um, to a lesser degree, it was a little disturbing. Some of the numbers, uh, Latino men and women, and and you know, of course, it never. Um, takes into consideration people on the gender spectrum. So we know that our, our siblings who um, don't subscribe to, to those um, are also in there in those numbers somewhere. Um, but you know, really what the numbers that came back tell us is we have huge opportunity in our own UU communities um, to do this, um, this outreach because it is by far white women and white men who are electing um, the folks into office that are problematic. Um, so, you know, while it's great to energize and motivate our communities of color and communities on margins, um, they're showing up, you know, in, in large numbers, um, disproportionate to any other, any other groups. Um, and so to, you know, kind of rest this at the feet of trying to make sure that those communities show up uh, versus communities who um, have privilege, have privilege to take time off of work to vote, have privilege to, you know, be able to canvas, to do all of the other things. Though, and those are the folks that are in our community. So, um, yes, you know, one day election day is important, but all those other days in between those elections is what's really, really important. Maybe we don't want white women to vote. Maybe we should do a campaign to keep white women from voting. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am so angry about those statistics coming out of Georgia. 78% more white women than white men voted against Stacey Abrams. I mean, I, I have to say I, that 53% for Trump has just hurt and you know, it, it hurts every day, but 78% like, <laughs> You know, I feel like those of us who are white women have some real work to do here, and um, I'm really interested in it. So I might jump in there. <laughs> That's another white woman in this group. Um, one thing, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people posting, I said this before we began, about wanting to sort of have a different identity. But uh, it, I think it's just so important to ask the deeper questions about, you um, there's the people who vote and then there's the people who aren't voting and why aren't they voting and why they don't feel like their vote makes a difference. I know in New Jersey, some of the things we're talking about today in the early 80s, there was something called voter caging, which was where they um, tried to massively get people off the rolls, primarily communities of color. Um, or we had um, a seven, six uh, Democrats and Republicans, and then Chris Christie redrew the map, and then it was six and six. And actually now it's a, it just flipped to 11 to one, which is, or one is still in dispute, the Andy Kim race. But I just think we, we have to, I wanna claim the identity as a white woman, and it may be because I come from a Jewish family and oppression is a part of the story that, that, that actually, we we can do better. We can learn. I think women, why are women voting with misogynists? They're aligning themselves with 
patriarchy and white supremacy because that's where the the power is but it it does not work out well in the end and i think many people are choosing maybe not to vote still we had I don't know what the percentages are, maybe one of you does, but the highest midterm election vote in the past was only 49% of those who were registered to vote. So I still think now we need to be doing the work towards the next election and anticipating the ways that um, politicians or systems without integrity are going to try to cheat to be able to anticipate and ensure um, you know, to work in advance to anticipate their moves so that we protect everyone's right to vote. Um, in terms of next steps, I know tomorrow, I wanna, uh, so here in, in, um, in Morris County anyway, um, and Essex County nearby, we were already, even before uh, number 45 got elected, we were already strengthening our um, companioning of immigrants because we were seeing deportations beginning to increase. So I also want to name that these systems have power beyond just the leaders. Tomorrow I'm going to be at uh, an event in front of the Essex County Jail around a hearing for Jorge Ch Chajon is his name and his family. And he may wind up deported um, tomorrow. And here's someone that grew up in our community. Um, and what does it mean that that people are being deported at an alarming rate? He actually stood up for the treatment of immigrants in the um, detention center that he was a part of. So they sent him to a worse detention center and promised him he would be punished. He hasn't, um, ICE has not produced him for the last two hearings. I, uh, and we're hoping he'll be produced for tomorrow so that he can have a fair um, hearing in front of a judge as fair as that is possible. So I'm also mindful that elections are only part of the work that we have to do for just communities and that there's work that pulls at my heart every um, day. Um, and on the, on the anti-Semitism piece, and Meg, you lifted up Unitarian Universalism. I feel like as a, as a person of Jewish heritage within Unitarian Universalism, I may have an important role to play. Um, it's a, I think where we make up maybe 10% of Unitarian Universalists. And I have to say, I've seen an increase in anti-Semitic in incidents that I've experienced both in the world in the last five years, 10 years, and within Unitarian Universalism. I, I'm a lifelong Unitarian Universalist and I've experienced far more microaggressions and some that feel more macro aggressions from Unitarian Universalists. Um, in the last decade than in the prior three, probably. So I think there's this, um, it's an important conversation for us to realize that we're of the culture as well as trying to counter the culture and what's the work that we have to do around our own learning um, in terms of what um, people of various marginalized identities are experiencing, not just in outside from quote unquote non-Unitarian Universalists, but from Unitarian Universalists. And that will better equip us to really see a mirror and make a difference in the world. And so I certainly see the mirror as a white woman and maybe I need to like show the mirror as someone with um, Jewish identity. Well, and I think that, you know, one thing I have noticed about us white women is the, um, there is there is something going on where I see white women speaking um, about progressive values and saying the right things, and then all of a sudden so there is some kind of blinder, or I don't know, I don't know what this is, and I and I feel like I need to do my work to to figure out what that is, and so the next steps are me doing my work as a white woman to, to really get inside of that response. What's hiding in there that makes white women vote this way and, and, and um, speak this way and think this way without apparently even noticing what it is that they are doing. Like there's some, I don't know, it's, it's super troubling to me. And, um, and I see it again and again. And oh, I think white women know what they're doing. Yeah, this is not out of ignorance. I mean, with all due respect. I no, no, I hear not you. Not out of ignorance. Yeah, yeah. Aligning with power and privilege. Right. 
Right. But it, it, and it, and it's, and as I said before, it still doesn't long-term work out well, <laughs> just until we built, yeah. until, I mean, you know, it's, it, we say it over and over again until all us of, of us are free, none of us are free. I mean, I think that's what the, the shooting in the tree of life congregation, I mean, it's, it, we're all on the front lines of a war in America on so many fronts. I mean, we, I mean, I'm thinking about guns. I don't know if you all saw the shooting this morning in the bar with college students. Mm -hmm. And of course I did you know, campus ministry for so long. Um, and it's, it's just, we have to work for um, integrity and our UU values and none of the political parties really represent our deeply held values. Um, and two of us just cut you off, Jessica. So I apologize. No, no. I mean, I think this is exactly what the work is that I need to do. <laughs> I mean, I think having people like, you know, say truth to me, speak truth to me is part of what I'm here for. So I'm here for it. Like, don't put on kid gloves. It's all good. Well, I'm, I'm going to do a little white woman parsing. And I'm curious, um, Asia and Christina, how you hear this, because I totally get it that white women are on board with white supremacy, like, like full tilt. But white women also like, I mean, have you read these statistics that since the Me Too movement, white women believe women less about sexual abuse surviving. Now, we know that these demographic, we know that some of these women not believing other women are themselves sexually abused. Statistically, they absolutely are. And that's the piece I'm trying to parse out is there is a piece of self-hatred or self-abnegation in there that's so deep because it's about, it's not even about you too. It's about me too. It's pe it's women not believing their own experience uh, and um, believing patriarchy and white supremacy more than their own body. And um, I think, I mean, our bodies, yes, have, have white privilege and and benefit from racism in in that way. But also with misogyny. I I mean I, that's. That's where I'm like, that's where you would hope the connection could get made, but I don't, I don't see a window into that connection, that intersectional connection, because, um, you know, when, when white women were like, ah, Donald Trump, boys will be boys, but when they're saying those women are lying, I know those women are liars, that, you know, and, and, and I'm highly suspecting that they also were sexually abused, just statistically, at least a bunch of them. Anyway, it's, it's not the center of the world, but it is part of what I'm trying to parse out is to figure out where are we just, are white women just that out of our bodies that we just aren't even tracking our own physical truth anymore at all because the lies have just filled us up completely. I don't know. But I, I think there is something to that, Mike. I think there's, um, you know, a conditioning of women, you know, in general, um, that says that we um, deserve this, that this is just the way it goes, right? And how dare those folks over there say the truth? Um, because if they're saying the truth, then, then what is wrong with me that, that I can't or don't or don't recognize it, right? And and so therefore, you know, I'm going to attack, attack that. Um, and the, the alignment with power has been so deeply ingrained in women in general and, and particularly white women um, that, that they haven't hit that tilt, right? That moment in which it's worse to continue, which I think women of color hit sooner in our lives than, than most other demographics, where the cost to you, to your soul, um, to your center is too great. And, and you hit that tilt point of, um, you know, it, the cognitive dissonance of, um, both believing in the savior of the white man and recognizing the destruction of the white man is just too great. And so something has to give. But I think 
in women of color, we, we hit that so much earlier in our lives um, that it's really clear, you know, where, um, what that decision is. And I think for some, you know, white women, it, at least it appears to me that that doesn't happen um, ever um, because they're very well taken care of in our society, you know, for the most part. And that, you know, feels good to be taken care of. And if you can only, you know, block off all of this, all of this privilege comes with it. Um, and, and yeah, I, I agree with Aisha. I don't think there's, there's any mistake in how they are voting or how they are running their lives or their garden parties or their universities or when they become into positions of power, their corporations, um, you know, having white women in positions of power in government and in corporations have not necessarily translated into better uh, standards for um, other marginalized communities ever. So that is not, you know, the end all be all. I'm always thrilled to see a woman um, or somebody who's non-binary um, move into positions of power, but it does not necessarily mean that, uh, that it is going to raise um, the rest of the boats in the harbor. It, it's just not true. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's, it's behooves us to, to, again, recognize that that's a large percentage of our Unitarian Universalist world. It is huge. And we have a huge opportunity here to say, what are y'all going to do about it? And so I'm, I'm thrilled that the folks on this panel are saying, yeah, um, but I both recognize the discomfort of that and also recognize that um, I think the amount that I'm willing to give that as a pass is, is small and finite. Well, it's not your path, is it? <laughs> yeah, you get to claim a different demographic and be real about it, yeah. Thank you. That was well, really helpful. I, I think too that there, you know, that it just occurs to me that part of it is white women um, protecting the privilege of their white sons and um, denying their own whatever it is that they want or need for themselves and just really going to bat for protecting that their their white son's future, the privilege and that access, I think is a piece of it. That's the real conversation. And that's my point. I mean, it, the, the, none of this now is, is out of ignorance. It's out of what people are getting. And so, yeah. yes, Meg, when you talk about the self-esteem of, um, or, or what people have been, women have been conditioned to believe or, but, but you get to the crux of it, Jessica. And that's, that's the point. Let's just have the real conversation. Cause I will tell you, even among, when you talk about Unitarian Universalists, white women, Unitarian Universalist ministers who hold up patriarchy strongly, don't want to talk about collaborative leadership. So there is an incentive for white women to make choices. And, and thank you, Jessica, for lifting up for their white son. So let's just have the real conversation and not pretend that any of this is born out of ignorance. You know, the thing I've been thinking about too is, um, the sa especially in terms of politics and elections, is what, is the, what are the sacrifices that we have made um, in order to gain a policy that may not even represent our ideal, that we align with um, the people in, in power um, and then sacrifice um, things that, that actually we care deeply about. Like one of the things I've been reflecting on holding that mirror, not only the fact that things were already getting worse for um, immigrants in our community before number 45 was in office, that was happening under um, quote unquote, you know, democratic leadership. Um, but looking at the ways that now we're looking at the treatment of women and women's bodies, um, but when the policies were perhaps more in favor of women's health um, access, we were willing to actually take a pass on, on men that actually showed zero integrity that they um, cared about really the total well being of the women in their life or the women that they had access to as powerful men. And so I think we're, I mean, this is something I'm thinking a lot about is this, this word, like what does integrity look like? 
what does um, a holding leadership accountable um, and not just going the expedient route. Now, I'm not advocating that we don't, you know, politically try to advance policies that we care about, but at the same time, what will we sacrifice? And I'll, I'll give you an example from the lens of sort of anti-Semitism uh, and the and the the Jewish conversation. I've I've heard people talk about some people supported some Jewish people supported Trump because they thought that he would be, uh, you know, pro Israel. And of course, not all Jews are pro everything Israel does. That's an anti-Semitic thing if that's the first thing you think. Um, but nonetheless. Um, some Jews did did vote that way, or I've even heard some people say, "Well, I don't think he's anti-Semitic," and I'm thinking, I don't know what internal. Well, I do know what internal conflict you're trying to work out, but by aligning yourself with this powerful person, that that is actually supporting nothing less than white male dominion over everyone else. Um, the policy is can be overturned in an instant. Like ultimately what he wants um, is, is male power to go back to an anti-bellum anti period. And frankly, if you read um, what's, there's, I wanna say there's the anti-Semitism from the left, anti-Semitism from the right in terms of politics. And then there's also a religious kind of anti-Semitism that Judaism is an inferior religion. And the way that works is that all the Jews are supposed to go back to Israel. It's a sign of the second coming um, of, of Jesus. And then they all die. They're like signposts to the end of the world. So I think people are accepting a policy that actually in it has their death <laughs> written into it, but they don't want to know it. They're like closing their eyes and they don't want to know it. And, and I think and I wanna say this with all humility, it's very easy. I have found myself too. It's very easy to not always see the larger narrative and how you're being complicit with a system. And so I, I'm not saying I always see it. I'm just really meditating here on what does integrity look like? What have we historically and currently sacrificed for policy advancement? And what is the greater loss um, for for society and for the well being of our of our planet even and humanity as well. I'll just say that in my years running the Washington D.C. office, there was never a single policy that I wasn't ambivalent about. I mean, the, so that is just the reality of policy. It's always radically imperfect. I mean, radically. I don't just mean like little things. I mean radically imperfect, and so. Like, so being a kind of anti-incremental, I understand that because that's who I am, but that's why I had to leave DC, but that's not how any, it's not how a sausage gets made. And, and what does that take from us? I mean, that's why I was saying Unitarian Universalism wasn't on the ballot, you know? I don't, there isn't a party, there isn't a policy that, I mean, that's just not where we're gonna find all of our values ever. Um, Christina, I wanted to say, I used the word actually in a way that I heard myself and went, actually, I said, well, actually, I really learned from what you said. And I thought, oh, that was kind of creepy. So I just wanted to name that because that word actually can be like, what a surprise. But actually, what surprised me was myself having some actual thought because I felt so stuck about that. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to name that because... Um, I've become aware of how some of those words are just like foo little digs. So, so that's Thank one that I, I just want to, yeah, absolutely. Michael, you've been quiet. <laughs> what are you up there thinking about? <laughs> Well, as the as the white man here today, uh, <laughs> my my demographic is is uh, hasn't even started to to grapple with this. Um, you know, I th I'm thinking about this is the power of white supremacy to replicate itself, right? So white working class people vote against working class interests all the time because they have been uh, convinced to buy into this, this white supremacy uh, culture, uh, right? So, and that's people of all genders who, um, who, who are in much the way, Meg, I heard you describe um, your, your experience of, of women 
not believing their own bodies. People, working class people have been, white working class people have been taught not to believe their own reality. Um, and so I'm okay with the fact that, that my work is with my white people um, and that, um, you know, largely what I have to preach is uh, to make people aware of the ways that white supremacy is affecting those of us who are white and the ways in which we can work to dismantle it um, in solidarity with our siblings of color. Um, I'm actually kind of proud of the white folks that I serve for calling out many of the lies that, that were told in this, um, in this campaign. And the ones that, that were local here were about affordable housing. And you know, that's the code word, right? Um, what, what communities get affordable housing? Ooh. Uh, because that probably means people of color, if not poor people, are moving into your in, into your into your town. Uh, and my folks called it out, and they said, "Boy, this is like this is racism. This is classism. This is unacceptable." Um, so I'm kind of proud of them for 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 not only noticing it but publicly calling it out time and again. Um, and, you know, I want, I need white men to grapple with white supremacy and I need white queer folks to grapple with white supremacy. And so I'm glad that more and more white women that I know are grappling with complicity, complicity in white supremacist systems. Um, and that's what I'm seeing today in this conversation. Uh, glad for it, but I, you know, we all need to. All of the, those of us who are white need to grapple with our complicity in white supremacist systems. And, you know, you can be disappointed that 78% of white women voted for Kemp or whatever, but, you know, I just, I don't even know what to say because the people who, who look like me and have the gender identity that I do, like the, the numbers turn my stomach. So, um, so I appreciate this conversation. And let's have just a moment about the rainbow wave, because um, I was looking the Victory Fund, which is a group that funds candid GLBT candidates. I was looking at their website, and they elected people in you know little offices in Arkansas, Alabama, anywhere you can name their um, queer people who came in. And again, I just feel like those are victories to celebrate. That's some family sacrifice, some real hard work people did. Yeah, and I. Uh, uh trans woman and a non-binary person were elected in, in Fairbanks, Alaska to borough and, and city positions, which is really pretty astounding. I mean, Alaska's a bastion of, of conservatism. Um, about that woman that wouldn't give the marriage license. She lost to one of the men she wouldn't give the license to. I mean, we really had some mwah. <laughs> and that doofus from Wisconsin, Walker, lost. That was awesome. Walker's out, yeah. And I love the idea that all those religious right people in Colorado Springs, Colorado now have a gay governor to answer to. <laughs> a, a gay Jewish governor. A gay Jewish governor, that's right, that's right. Yeah, and a, a lesbian um, Jewish woman beat this real big homophobe racist, just ugh, suburban guy here. And I just love, she's like the first lesbian mom to be in Congress. So anyway, there, there is good news and, and it's hard work. People, people worked hard. So um, I'm hoping next time we didn't get to, Aisha and Christine are just back from the Liberal Religious Educators Conference, which I watched a little of it on a live stream and it looked pretty exciting speaking of ways forward. So I'm hoping next week we can talk all about that. Are you all here next week? Oh, good. Yes. Oh, good. Let's do that and invite some other people. Allison, you got something you want to say? You have to unmute first. <laughs> there. Okay. Um, I was thinking about that once, what's next question and something that's going on um, that, that I'm finding exciting here locally is that we're, because the the other thing is I think this this redistricting, the way all that works is by separating us into sort of artificial town lines that you barely even notice when you cross. And this one gets drawn in and this one gets drawn out. And we're actually looking at the map of Northern New Jersey and taking a fairly broad swath and have clergy who are meeting across really diverse religious traditions and lay leaders to build trust with one another. Because I realized that 
um, so some of the topics we're talking about as, as a, as a person with Jewish identity, I have certain fears, I mean, and have had experiences, people of color have certain fears and experiences, the immigrants in our community have certain fears and experiences. And what we're trying to learn to do is get to know each other, really entrust what are the um, matters of greatest concern for, and across the socioeconomic um, continuum as well, that we can entrust one another with and actually move forward with a collaborative uh, platform to really affect change and to show up for one another so that for local, uh, local issues in a town, you might have a thousand people or couple thousand people really show up supporting. I don't just care what happens in Morristown, but I care what happens in Dover or different locations. And that feels really hopeful and exciting. And um, especially because so many things are decided locally these days. So I, I love what Michael shared about um, sort of the, and, and what you shared about the rainbow wave too and all these localities. And I thought I would offer that up, how we can break across localities to make a difference too. Well, that's a nice parting word for us all. Thank you. Thanks, Allison, for visiting. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. And we'll see you next time.